We move from there to UFC 194. The party just keeps on going. No pun on Lance Palmer there, but man, we got a lot of fights going on this week. So Saturday night is going to be rocking at the MGM Grand. Peter, anything on the prelim you want to touch on before we move on to the prelims in the main card? Well, <laughs> on the 194 prelims, like you have named fighters even all the way down at the fight pass level. Yeah. Yeah, you mean got... Court McGee, John McDessie, Joe Proctor, and that's a fight pass? Are you kidding? Yeah. Yeah, this is one of the best cards the UFC has ever put on. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe the best, but, you know, given the, the construction of the roster now as opposed to, you know, 10 years ago, I think this is, based on the time we're in now for MMA, probably the best card the UFC has ever put on. The only thing that sticks out like a sore thumb, and I give all respect to her because she just did an interview with MMA Oddsbreaker, and she's taking this fight on very late notice, but Jocelyn jones Liebarger going against Tisha Torres, that one is the only one that says, like, wait a minute, one of these people is not the same as the other. Yeah, actually, Tisha Torres isn't even... Uh, like top three on biggest favorites on the card. Um, there's really? a couple that are, uh, I, that are I, well ahead of her. I would have expected her to be a huge favorite over the newcomer, but what do I know? What is the line on that? Uh, Tisha Torres is minus 275, Liebarger is plus 235. So hmm. relatively close. Uh, and I think it's a respect factor from betters, at least for, uh, for Jocelyn Jones Liebarger, because she is a pretty solid fighter. You know, just had a, a really good performance against, you know, granted a, a faded Zoila Frosto Gurgel or whatever she's calling herself these days. Uh, and Tisha Torres, we've seen her struggle against people that can grapple and, uh, Liebarger can grapple a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, six and one ain't no joke, but I, I do again take that whole short notice thing into account here. So I favor yeah. Torres and, uh, I don't see that changing. No, no I got no, Torres I as well. Her. Yeah, I got Torres as well. The only thing about Liebarger, she is the RFA champ. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, she's not, she's not a tomato can here. She's a definitely a strong fighter. And the only thing about Torres that, you know, people are always going to look at on her record is that, uh, she has that, she's the one in six and one on Paige Van Zandt. That's true. That is absolutely true. So, as long as we're talking about this Fox Sports One card, let's go to Leonardo Santos and Kevin Lee at lightweight. What do you say, Brad? What's the odds on this? Well, this is one of the fights where the uh, the favorite is bigger than Tisha Torres. Uh, Kevin Lee is minus 650. And Whoa. Uh, I, honestly, I think everything, every cent of that is deserved. I actually threw him in a parlay at minus 600 because Kevin Lee is, you know, he's a very, very good prospect. Uh, physically and athletically, he is well beyond anything Leonardo Santos could ever hope to be. Uh, on the feet, he's going to have a big speed and power advantage, massive, massive wrestling advantage. And uh, Leo Santos, you know, even given his grappling credentials, he's always been far more of a, a dangerous top position grappler than a guard player. So once Kevin Lee puts him on his back, uh, I actually think Lee is going to do a lot of damage. Wouldn't be shocked to see him get a, a TKO stoppage here, but I really like Kevin Lee really high on him as a prospect. And he's another one of those guys that always looks good stepping off the scale. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So he'll probably have the power advantage. I think the line is not incorrect in this case. Peter, what do you think? I am i didn't think the line would be that high, but I see, I see Brad's point on that. Uh, Santos, you know, I have that feeling where... You're right, but being on the bottom and working a submission, I agree with you. I don't see this fight being a stand-up battle at all. I think it is going to go right down to the ground. And Lee's got that nasty, I mean, he could just, you know, help death from above, basically, and just take out Santos with the TKO. I can see that easily. But I don't know. Santos, if you're looking for an upset pick, you might put a couple of bucks down. But Lee is, in my opinion, Lee wins this fight. All right. Well, here's one I absolutely have no idea how to call it because they're both undefeated and both UFC prospects. So it seems to me like a coin flip, but Brad, Worley Alves, and Colby Covington. Well, up until uh, a few hours ago, actually, it basically was a coin flip. Uh, the line was pretty much dead even. 
Uh, as it stands right now, Colby Covington is just a, a minus 120 favorite. Warley Alves is plus 100. So very, very close line for a very, very close fight. Um, there's a lot of ways that I could see this one going. Uh, in the end, I do lean towards Covington slightly because uh, we saw him get put in but also get out of a bad spot against Mike Pyle. And I think that the bad spots from Warley Alves are going to happen early and not so much as the the fight drags on. So I think Colby Covington takes the decision here, but huge, huge potential for Warley Alves to catch him with something early. Peter, what do you think? I think Covington wins with a rear naked choke like he did against Wagner Silva. Okay. Well, I will lean that way myself. And that just leaves us one more fight on the FS1 card. We referenced it earlier, Uriah Faber and Frankie Science. I really don't even think this is much of a fight for Favor. I think he blows through him. Yeah, and the the lines indicate that as well. Favor is the biggest favorite on this particular card. Uh, he's minus 750. Comeback on Frankie Science is plus 525. And yeah, I think it's going to be typical Uriah Faber type of fight where, you know, anytime he was facing guys that he even were, you know, just a couple slots in the rankings below him, you know, top five, top ten type guys, he was finishing them regularly. And I think that's probably what's going to happen here. I think he's going to catch signs with something on the feet, force signs into a bad takedown, and either guillotine him or, or get to the back and get that rear naked choke. So I do like Uriah Faber by submission here. And hopefully with no Francisco Rivera-style controversy. Exactly, yeah. All right, Peter, what do you say? Well, this up-and-comer Uriah Faber, hopefully after this win, he'll be back on the main card. <laughs> How did I know you were going to make a joke about that? <laughs> Jeez. No, Faber wins here, no doubt. I'm just tired of seeing him on the prelims. He's a main event fighter. He actually said that he likes being on the, the prelims. I can't remember. I think it had something to do with uh, like the sponsorship deal, so I'm not sure if that's changed now with Reebok coming in. But mm-hmm. I know previously uh, he could like wear more of his torque stuff and uh, all that. So uh yeah, there was there was a reason that he was in the Fox Sports 1 main event so many times in a row. Yeah, he he wanted those eyeballs on whatever sponsorships he had. He's been pretty blatant about that. Yeah. Yeah, well, when it comes to favor, it's just I don't know. I he he you see him a lot now with this whole thing with uh Team Alpha Male and the whole controversy there and you know, I always see him as a main event guy, so that's just me. I don't know. I understand the money thing. I understand the Reebok deal. I mean, maybe it's because he's one of the fighters that got his jersey spelled right. He's no Anderson Aldo, but, uh, you know. Well, and he's going to be taken care of anyway since it's tiered based on how many fights you've had. And between WEC and UFC, he's had a shit ton. Yeah. That's true. So his Reebok payout is pretty nice, which uh, is probably a little better than uh, Max Holloway and Jeremy Stevens, especially Holloway, since he's such a young gun. Well, even though Holloway's young, he's already got, what, 10 fights in the UFC? Right, but like, I he, think, I think you got to get to 11, 11 to 15 to get to that next level. So one more and he's got it. <laughs> well, that's probably why he's taking so many fights so quickly. He wants to, to get some sponsorship dollars, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So is he the favorite here? I would expect so. He is, in my opinion, far too much of a favorite in this fight. Um, I do agree that he has some advantages over Jeremy Stevens. You know, if this is another fight where if it goes to decision, I think Max Holloway is going to be the, the victor. But he's minus 550, and Jeremy Stevens is plus 425. You know what? And, I'd whoa. put a hundo on Stevens for that, because he's got one-punch knockout power. Well, the other thing I was going to mention is uh, Jeremy Stevens by TKO which is, if he wins, is how he's going to win, is plus 885. Oh, my. Wow. Yeah, I would... Uh, I'm not a betting man, but I would so put 100 on that. Yeah, that's that's the line that uh, that I picked out of this fight. You know, very good chance that it loses, because I do agree that Max Holloway should be the favorite, but that's the type of line that only has to, to win, you know, one out of ten times, and I definitely give Jeremy Stevens a better shot than that. Yeah, he Way better than a 1 in 10 chance. That guy hits harder than a fucking brick. He can pack a punch. Yep. Just when it comes to Holloway, though, <laughs> there you go. No, with Holloway, his last loss was against Conor McGregor back in 2013. Since then, he's been on a seven-fight win streak. So maybe that's why his line is a little bit higher for uh, Holloway here. 
Well, and he does have that, like I said, that young gun aura about him right now. He does. He seems like a guy that's on his way to being a featherweight contender. Yeah, you can some say with, some say he's blessed. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> All right, the next fight on the card is Damian Maya. There he is again, coming back up in the conversation, facing Gunnar Nelson. Uh, I would expect Maya to be the favorite. He is a favorite, but he's a very, very slight favorite. He's only minus 130. Gunnar Nelson is plus 110. And I can sort of see why. Uh, there's a lot of hype behind Gunnar Nelson. You know, obviously he showed off his striking a little bit against Brandon Thatch there. And we know that, uh, that he's got a very, very good grappling game. But in this fight, uh, you know, I just look at it and I see it being another type of fight that should go well for Demi and Maya. Very good at getting inside. And once he gets there, uh, an excellent, excellent clinch wrestler uh, and great top control. So, you know, I don't think he's going to be submitting Gunnar Nelson or anything like that. But if he can get top control for two rounds, he'll probably pass guard a little bit. Gunnar Nelson will put him back in guard. But I think Maya's going to win that way. And I think the the price is pretty low. Peter, what do you think? Um, I actually have Gunnar winning by submission. Really? I don't know if that's an upset or not, but his record and his his way he wins fights, and I know the quality of opponent, you know, isn't exactly top tier, but I just have that sinking feeling where I'm going to go with Gunner and, you know, maybe put a hundo on it if I was a betting man. I would be very shocked if he managed to submit Demi and Maya. <laughs> yeah, that, that one was straight out of left field for me, so you caught me off guard, Peter, congrats. <laughs> It happens. Yeah. Well, next on the card is Jacare Souza and Yuel Romero, the soldier of God. Also, the soldier of not getting up off his stool when he's supposed to. So, who wins <laughs> this fight? What are the odds right now, Brad? Uh, another close fight, and this honestly starts a, a string of three fights that are just absolute A-plus fights. Uh Jacques Array is a slight favorite again, minus 150. Yoel Romero, plus 130. And it's another fight, you know, you could really see going either way. I do favor Jacques Array slightly, just because I think that he's got a path to victory in terms of his submissions. Uh, we have seen Romero rocked before, and uh, Jacques Array's striking is greatly improved, so we have uh, could see a, a TKO there. Or if he can get him down a couple times, which we have seen UL Romero susceptible to takedowns at points in his career, uh, could be able to grind out a decision. So I do favor Jacare, but man, it's tough to bet against UL Romero because the dude is capable of some incredible, incredible stuff and he can just flip the switch at any moment and it could be lights out for Jacare. I feel like you've just written my summation for me, Brad, because every time <laughs> I've picked against Yuel Romero, he's found a way to pull it out. I've time and time again said he's too old, he started too late, he shouldn't be able to do these things, but I've had to reevaluate that stance and decide that because he got into fighting so late, maybe he just doesn't have that wear and tear, and that's why he can keep doing the things that he does. So, you know what? Maybe the odds are actually not quite right on this one. I might actually say that Yoel Romero should be the favorite, even though I've been in Jacare Souza's camp for the longest time. It seems to me like Romero might just do it again here. Wow. I've got uh, Jacare by uh, by submission. I think he laps on the armbar and taps him out. I would love nothing more, but I've just seen Romero pull victory from the jaws of defeat so many times, it's hard for me to not think he can do it again. Just please, whatever you do in your post-fight promo, don't ask America if we lost our direction. We don't need that controversy oh, all again. over again. <laughs> not again. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, America, I don't, have you lost your direction? I just don't want to hear about gay Jesus, that's all. <laughs> uh, that was one of the greatest post-fight interviews of all time. And that still, awesome. still being debated to this day as to what he actually said. Nobody <laughs> really knows. <laughs> oh man. You're holding the microphone. What do you think? And how do I turn this off? Or, uh, do I walk away from this guy or what? Like, what do you do in that case? Uh, you can't really walk away from the soldier of God. You see the muscles on that guy? If yeah. he wants the mic, you give him the mic. Yeah. That man is 
He's a different breed of human being. He's just absolutely insane. Yes. And uh, speaking of insane, I expect this fight to be a classic. This is a fight I've been waiting for for a long time. Chris Weidman, Luke Rockhold, to me, the two best middleweights on the planet right now, bar none. I realize that Shakare and Romero are the next contenders up, but Rockhold, to me, is on another level above either of them, and Weidman is a little bit above that, so this this is going to be an outstanding fight, and if the line isn't almost dead even, I'll be shocked. <laughs> well, you're right again. Uh, close line, but Chris Weidman is the, the slight favorite. Uh, minus 140 for Weidman, plus 120 for Rockhold. And I know you said you think uh, Chris Weidman's just a little bit above Rockhold. I think Chris Weidman is actually a, a decent amount above Rockhold, and I expect him to look very, very good in this fight. So I think their striking styles match up very well. You know, if this was a kickboxing bout or something like that, might give Rockhold the the, uh, the slight edge, but I think Weidman's forward pressure is really going to shut down a lot of Rockhold's kicking game. We actually have seen Rockhold knocked out a few times in his career, so it wouldn't be altogether shocking to see that happen again. And I think that Weidman's the, the better wrestler, so Rockhold's got the, the flashy submission game, but I think that Weidman technically is uh, a very, very good submission grappler himself, and I th- actually think he's a better grappler overall than Rockhold. So give him a lot of edges everywhere this fight goes, and uh, I like Chris Weidman to pick up the win. And the only thing I could say that would pierce any holes in that, because I 98% agree with everything you said, Brad, but the other 2% of me says, I was there for the Weidman Machida fight in Vegas, and... I thought Weidman was just going to have his day all day with that fight. And in those later rounds, you know, I don't usually think of Weidman as a guy that has a cardio problem or gets tired. But in those later rounds, Machida turned it on and nearly got him. That is very true. But, uh, you know, you look at those points that right after Machida almost got Weidman, he woke back up. He answered right back and, and he almost finished Machida in... I believe it was the fourth round was the one that was really, really back and forth. Um, it was either the fourth or the fifth, but Weidman, you know, he got tested and he really answered the bell. I can't argue that. So I'll still go with him as a favorite. I won't bet against him. But Peter, do you pick an upset here, even though it's a very narrow upset? No, I got the champ retaining here. Uh, I'm, I'm even going to say it's not going to go to the judges. And hopefully a, a victory here by Weidman will shut up both Rockhold and Bisping. <laughs> I don't think anything will shut up Bisping ever. Mm, a right well, it's just a, it's a good thing that uh, John Jones is back because otherwise we'd have to listen to Daniel Cormier blab on about uh, Rockhold being better than Weidman too. <laughs> Brad, did you see the photo of John Jones's new physique? I, I did. Holy smokes! Hey, that's crazy. Yeah, he's a. Uh, Man, he was great before, possibly the greatest. And uh, Daniel Cormier is, uh, you know, he's counting down the days until he's not champion anymore. You well, he had an interesting that, quote. Well, you think yeah, it's that easy. cut and dry? I mean, you give Cormier no chance to retain at all. I, I bet John Jones big in the first fight, and you know, if all of the the rumors and everything are true, he basically trained about a month for Daniel Cormier for that fight and you know, obviously had his issues with uh, substances and other things. If he's clean and focused and goes in there against Cormier, I am I would be kind of surprised, even as tough as Daniel Cormier is, if he makes the final bell. Yeah. No, the point I was going to make was Cormier said in a quote uh, this past week that being all muscle-bound now, Jones... Is that it's taking away part of the what made what took him to the? Whoop, I'm trying it again. What brought, what him, brought to him to the, the dance? dance. I yeah, knew that. I knew that's what you were gonna say. <laughs> yeah, well, I can see that argument, but I you also have to know that Jones doesn't have a fight date scheduled yet, and he's not gonna come into the fight that muscled up. He's definitely gonna slim down during his oh, actual yeah. training camp. Yeah, well, they have that date scheduled for Madison Square Garden. If quotation if New York wakes up, but. Yeah, should be odds on that. Yeah, I was just about to say, (laughs) let's get a line on whether or not there's going to be fights in Madison Square Garden. 
Well, there is a line on the actual fight. Uh, John Jones is a minus 325 favorite for that fight. So they're assuming the event does take place then. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not listed for any particular venue, but usually they'll do something like, yeah, put a disclaimer on that bet that the fight would have to take place before June 30th of 2016 or something like that. If it doesn't take place, then the bet gets refunded or whatever. I don't exactly, know. yeah. Right. Okay, well, one, they're not going to have to refund unless uh, both guys trip and break an ankle on their way to the octagon. Jose Aldo and Conor McGregor, and I should probably knock on wood for saying that because we were supposed to get this fight in July, and I don't want anything to screw it up this time. I want it to happen. So what are the odds, Brad? Tell us. Well, they've changed quite a bit uh, just over the the past week or so. But as it stands right now, Conor McGregor is a a slight favorite. He's minus 120. Jose Aldo is plus 100. Uh, A couple weeks ago, McGregor was up to minus 180, and Aldo was plus 160. So we're starting to see the, uh, the support for the champion come in and... I am definitely one of those people supporting uh, Jose Aldo in this fight. Uh, my maximum bet is uh, a five-unit bet. That's usually uh, about as high as I go in terms of bets, and I do have five units on Jose Aldo here. I just think, you know, Conor McGregor, he is very skilled. Uh, you know, excellent striker, excellent timing, excellent accuracy. But Jose Aldo is a completely different level in terms of his speed. Uh, I think that he's going to be able to to get in and get uh, get some damage on McGregor early. Uh, I think that McGregor, you know, five months uh, is not a lot of time for a partially torn ACL to heal completely and then do a full training camp for the toughest fighter you're ever going to face. And obviously there's the question of McGregor's wrestling and ground game. If Jose Aldo gets this fight to the ground, I think it's over within two minutes. So a lot of factors pointing me towards Jose Aldo here. Well, you said something I want to key on, Brad, and that's coming back off a torn ACL because the Georgia Karakanian fight with Daniel Weichel, going into the fight, I fully believed the hype that he was going to come out there and do what he did to Bubba Jenkins. But coming off that torn ACL and putting in a camp and coming into the fight, he didn't fight like the same fighter. I don't know if he was scared to pull the trigger or he just lost a little bit of his speed, but that is a very difficult injury to come back 100% from. No matter how ready you say you are, it's never going to be quite the same again. Yeah, And Jose Aldo is not the type of fighter you want to give up any speed to in the first place. So <laughs> No, you don't. There is a reason he is the longest tenured champion in UFC right now. So, Peter, what do you say? I got the champ retaining in, oh, I'll just say the third round. It doesn't even go to the championship rounds uh, by submission. Connor's going to tap out, and then I just can't wait for that post-fight. What's going to happen after that? <laughs> you think Aldo's retiring, then? You're convinced. No, I think Aldo will be like, who's the Joker? That's right, you just tapped or something like that. You're like a pro wrestling style trash talk after. These two guys, I don't think they're going to have a barbecue afterwards. No, but they might as well because they're both getting a license to print money. So either one can throw a barbecue for the other. And the winner gets the cover of the EA video game. Yeah. Ooh, I'm sure that's their their biggest motivation for the fight. Well, they're sharing it with uh, with Rousey apparently, but I think this is the first time a video game cover has been decided by an actual fight. Yeah, well, well, if they're sharing it with Rousey, shouldn't they make it so that the loser gets the cover of the, oh. the game? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> ouch! Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, what was I going to say? I had some really smart thing to say, so just pretend that I said something smart. <laughs> Well, I'll say something smart then. I think Conor McGregor suffers nothing with a loss here. Even if he gets submitted, even if he gets humbled, I think Conor McGregor's personality will carry him through to getting more big fights and more big paydays because whether he wins or not, people like Conor McGregor's personality and style. Well, and it's not even the fact that they necessarily like it, but uh, it could also be that they dislike it, right? Well, yeah, if yeah. they love to love you or they love to hate you, as long as they care one way or the other. Yeah, but he, as you said, he's uh, he's set. Uh, he's done a masterful job of promoting himself and, you know, getting uh, getting attention from some of these other fighters and just putting himself out there where we could see Conor McGregor fight, you know, 
Don Cerrone, Rafael Dos Anjos, whoever loses that fight, that would be a huge fight. Uh, if McGregor loses this one, if he's champion, obviously every fight of his is going to be huge. But, uh, yeah, Conor McGregor's not going anywhere. You know what I want to see? This is just my own opinion and probably shared by nobody else. But if Faber blows through science and McGregor loses to Aldo, then go ahead and put together Conor McGregor and Uriah Faber because we just watched the whole season of it anyway. Well, I didn't watch any of it, but, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Peter? Be an entertaining lead up to the fight. Well, we've already had the lead up to the fight. Now they just need to have the fight. Oh yeah, but just have them at the weigh-ins and have a little shoving contest with Dana White trying to get between the two? Yeah, that'd be fun. I know you didn't see the season, Brad, but all they need to do to sell the fight is Uriah Favor walk out and hand a pair of flip-flops to Conor McGregor, and then it's on. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Favor does seem like a, a flip-flop aficionado, and uh, I'm not sure McGregor would be caught dead in them. <laughs> 